Welcome to the Prince Street Church Podcast, where God's Word speaks to everyday life. As I was growing up in Allentown, Pennsylvania, I thought the end of the world was going to happen at any moment. I was raised in an evangelical congregation that preached the Word. I was also raised in the Cold War era. And when you're raised in an evangelical church in the Cold War era, lots of things made you think that the end of the world was going to come either through nuclear annihilation or through God's hand of judgment, His final judgment. And perhaps those two things were going to work together to bring the end of the world. And so I can remember, still to this day, watching the movie Apocalypse Now in my junior high Sunday school class. And I can remember our teacher, a good, godly, biblically solid man, explaining how the attack helicopters flying in formation were the fulfillment of the prophecy in Revelation chapter 9 about the swarms of locusts. Perhaps you recall that teaching as well because it wasn't just Don Cook who taught that. That was a very common thought in the day. And you know, it could be that they're right someday. But at the present moment, it certainly just seems as though that interpretation was just a misunderstanding. And there have been plenty of those as time has gone by. Throughout the 20th century, a variety of predictions about the end of the world have come and gone. Some of you may remember the name Herbert Armstrong. Anybody remember Herbert Armstrong? Couple, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, Herbert Armstrong said that um, the rapture was going to take place in 1936. He later updated his calculations to 1943, 1972, and then 1975. I guess after four, be- four times being wrong, he stopped doing the math. Then there was Chuck Smith. Anybody remember Chuck Smith? Nobody? Chuck Smith? Chuck Smith said that the generation of 1948 would be the last generation and the end of the world would come in 1981. Now, that logic made a lot of sense. But last I checked, um, we're still here. Pat Robertson joined the movement in 1976 when he predicted the end of the world was going to come in 1982. And then in 1990, he updated his math to come up with 2007. No doubt, many of us remember all of the anxiety surrounding Y2K. Over 20 different predictions came and went surrounding the changing into the year 2000, including names like Nostradamus, Sir Isaac Newton, um, Jonathan Edwards, Jerry Falwell, and Tim LaHaye. Then there was, of course, the Mayan calendar that was going to run out on December 21st, 2012. Apparently, Back then, the world was going to end either with an asteroid collision, an alien invasion, or a supernova. Strike one, strike two, (laughs) strike three. Then, of course, there was the whole Harold Camping thing. By the way, for those of you who still want a date who still want a date to be anticipating, you may want to include this date on your calendar. The year 10 to the 100th power. Do you have a calendar out that far? The year 10 to the 100th power, uh, we're told that that is when the heat death of the universe 
is going to take place. So you may want to put a reminder in your smartphone even this morning so that you don't forget when that day comes. Well, today the, the Cold War has come and gone. School children no longer hide under their desks as though ducking and covering could do anything about a nuclear blast. And yet, the world remains in turmoil. The world continues to be a very unstable place. And we're told that we should just go about living our lives as normal. And to some degree, we must. But when we take our eyes off the future, when we lose a sense of anticipation and expectation about the future, then we're left to drown in the swirling distractions of the present. We end up living our day, surviving our day, hoping to get at least enough of our to-do list done in a day that we can finally get to bed and hopefully not drown tomorrow. And when we allow our minds to become numbed by the swirling distractions of, of the present, then we end up creating multiple problems for ourselves in our journey of becoming healthy, growing, reproducing disciples of Jesus Christ. And that's why this season of Advent is so very helpful for us as God's people. It is in the season of Advent that we're reminded that this life as wonderful as this life is, this life is not all there is. A greater day is coming. For just as certainly as Jesus came as a baby in a manger, he is coming again as King of King and Lord of Lords. Amen? Amen. Thanks be to God. Yeah, a greater day is coming. And as we, as we anticipate the celebration of Christmas, as we do all of the preparations, this season of Advent gives us a reason to maintain the sense of expectation and anticipation as we get ready for the coming of the Christ, as we eagerly anticipate the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this morning I want to share with you another passage of Scripture that describes what it is that we are eagerly anticipating. This morning I want to help pick our eyes up off of the swirling distractions of our culture and, and, and all of the things that pack our calendars right now. Lift our eyes up and anticipate that coming day. So grab your Bibles and your note sheets and turn with me to 2 Peter Chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. That's a little book way back at the back of the New Testament. It may take you just a few moments to find it. If you're struggling, don't worry about you, or don't, don't, don't uh, hesitate to use the table of contents in the front of your Bible. It'll get you there pretty quickly. Now, as you get there, let me give you a little background. Uh, Peter was one of the first disciples. Peter was a brash, confident man who often ran his mouth before fully engaging his brain. I can relate to Peter. Peter was also one of the three members of Jesus' inner circle, his closest friends, those with which he entrusted great work of ministry. And so we're not surprised when Peter becomes one of the most aggressive leaders in the early church. In our Bibles, we have two different letters from Peter. Letters that he wrote to people who lived in the region of what is now modern-day Turkey. In the first of these letters... Peter is giving some guidance about how to deal with persecution as it comes to the church from outside. And his second letter 
he gives instructions about how to deal with false teachers and evildoers who have infiltrated the church. And as he concludes his second letter, Peter does some teaching about the last days. He describes a day when people will intentionally forget that God created everything that is. He describes a day when people rarely talk about the fact that Christ is coming again and that when it's talked about, well, it's just sort of laughed off. I don't know about you, but that sounds an awful lot like modern-day America. Today, Hollywood has rewritten the story of Moses to write out the hand of God as much as possible. In the church, we rarely talk about Christ's coming again. We talk about the weather. We talk about hunting trips. We talk about Little League baseball games more than we talk about Christ's coming. We anticipate musicals and cookies and candlelight in a Christmas Eve service more than we anticipate the coming of the Christ. And when the conversation of Christ's coming comes off, well, <laughs> that's, just, that, that's just really nice that you think that, right? And so the instructions that Peter gives about how we're supposed to live when this day comes is incredibly relevant to our lives today. So let me take you to 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning at verse 8. Peter writes, Do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Now you remember the first lesson of theology, right? God is God. I am not. Right? That would solve a whole lot of problems right there if we would keep that in the front of our mind. God is God, I am not. And so when it comes to the timing of events, whether it's God's answer to our prayers or the final revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, when it comes to the timing of events, there's a couple of things that we need to keep in mind, a couple of things we need to understand. First, God's clock is not required to stay in sync with ours. Okay? We live in a time-based experience that is very precise. And we as Americans are ridiculously tuned to time. For us, it is impossible to comprehend an environment in which time doesn't exist. And yet, that is the experience in which God lives. God lives outside of our definitions of time. He's not limited by that dimension as we are. For God, a day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years like a day. So when it seems that God is being slow in his answers, 
We need to remember the problem lays on our end, not on his. But there's something else we need to remember about the timing of the end times, of the final revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is a reason why Christ has not yet returned. Christ's delay is a means of extending mercy to humanity. That's what it says in God's word. You know, sometimes our tendency to focus on our own experience clouds our perspective of God. We want Christ to come when and how we want it. I was talking with David yesterday a bit. And I said, um, like, we want God to come before that History Day project is due, right? Right, Dad. <laughs> and once you've done it, you'd like for him to lay a little more, right? Uh-huh. I mean, because you wouldn't want to have done a History Day project, and then Jesus comes. Yeah. In our tendency to focus on our own experience, we have this habit of allowing our our expectations of God and our view of God to become clouded. And so when things are going well in our lives, we're okay with God's delay. There's some choir members <laughs> who've been working really hard to put together a musical, and we'd be really sort of miffed a bit if he came like at 6 o'clock next Sunday morning. You know... <laughs> But when things aren't going well, that's when we start getting uneasy. We want Christ to come because we're tired of the sickness and the despair and the pain of this world. We're tired of dealing with the downward spiral of our culture. We want heaven because it's better than what we're experiencing at the moment. And in our self-centered arrogance, we have come to expect receiving what we want, when we want it, and how we want it. That's the culture we live in. And we allow that to become reflected on the way we view God. It also impacts the way we view our world. So although we know there are many people who are lost in Shippensburg, across the United States, and around the world, we know this, but we do little to nothing about it. Fact of the matter is, we are far more interested in our own experience than in their eternal destiny. Oh, we're okay talking about reaching those who are lost as long as we're getting what we want first. Remember the first lesson of theology? God is God. I am not. Thanks be to God. See, God's preferred option is that everyone would repent of their sin. So that on the day of judgment, there would be nothing to judge. And so Christ has not yet come because God is being merciful. He continues to extend his gift of grace to the world so that anyone and hopefully everyone will call on the name of the Lord and be saved. But make no mistake about it. God will not let evil go on forever. There will be an end. However overdue the Lord's coming may seem to be for us, it will come. It will be unexpected and it will be final. The righteousness of God is greater than any sin or wickedness in this earth. So just as surely as God created everything that is, 
everything that is not righteous will be destroyed. And righteousness will be all that remains on the earth. Amen? Yeah. Thanks be to God. This is what we anticipate. This is what we look forward to. And the question that we should be asking as we are waiting is not, how much longer, Lord? The question we should be asking is, how ought we live as we wait? As we eagerly anticipate the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. And for the answer to that question, we go back to Peter's advice. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 11 to 14. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destructions of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Oh, brothers and sisters, waiting For the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ is not a passive thing. It's not about being a good religious person. It's not about fancy programs and beautiful decorated buildings. That's not the commission God has laid on the church. This task of waiting isn't about coming to Christ as your Savior and kicking back on your spiritual recliner, waiting for Him to return. No, the waiting that we're called to participate in is an active thing. It is a very active thing. We're called to wait, and it's not just about waiting. We're called to wait well, to be intentional about what it is that we're doing. We are called to live into the hope that one day depravity will be overcome, that a new heaven and a new earth will be established and righteousness will be at home again on the earth. And I want you to notice, let me take you back to verse 14. This is a critical verse for you to see. Look at it here. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found what? Spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Yeah. Through the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit, we are called to be intentional about living holy and godly lives. Being saved of our sin is not the finish line. It's just the beginning. The beginning of a lifelong journey of becoming a healthy, growing, reproducing disciple of Jesus Christ. You know, as 2014 comes to a close, and as 2015 looms on the horizon, many of us will find ourselves in these next couple of weeks doing some reflection, doing some assessment. We'll begin setting goals or resolutions for the future. We'll set goals for ourselves about things like diet and exercise because we're all going to engage in eating far too many cookies next Sunday morning, right? And we've been doing that since about the week before Thanksgiving. So with the new year, we'll need the new diet. Those of us who are working will very likely be going through a process of evaluating and setting plans and goals for the next year. We'll update our financial plan. And reset our calendar, trying to make sure that we are doing the things that are important and not just being overwhelmed by the urgent. So as you, as you do this, as we do this together, I want to encourage you to do some spiritual assessment as well by using these three words from our purpose statement, healthy, growing, and reproducing. That word healthy, we have a very simple definition. You want to know what a healthy disciple of Jesus Christ looks like? Look at Jesus. That's our definition. 
And so the questions that we need to be asking is, are we walking as Jesus walked? Are our minds being calibrated by the Word of God so that we are thinking not through the wisdom of this world, but with the mind of Christ? Are our attitudes about people being shaped by the heart of God? So that we're responding to others, whether they make us happy or not, the way Jesus responds to others. Are our lives so attuned by the Holy Spirit that our behaviors are being transformed in such a way that people see our good deeds and praise our Father in heaven? Remember Peter's instructions. Make every effort... Make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. We are called to be intentional about living holy and godly lives. Are we healthy disciples of Jesus Christ? Are we walking as Jesus walked? Now, obviously, none of us are all the way there yet. And that's why we include this word growing in this, three, this set of three words. So we need to ask ourselves, are we growing in our relationship with God and humanity in such a way that the evidence of transformation is showing itself in our lives? Ask yourself, what specifically can I point to as a concrete example of how God through the presence and power of his Holy Spirit, is growing me in these areas. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Have, have you heard those things before, perhaps? Yeah, we know we're supposed to be. If we are abiding in Christ, we know that those things will be growing in our lives. So... Can you jot down an example, a concrete example of how you've seen God changing you, growing you, transforming you in those areas? By the way, if you can't, that should get your attention. Because something is wrong. Something's very wrong. If you're not seeing the Holy Spirit produce increasing fruit in your life. Healthy, growing. Then there's that last word. If we're waiting well, we'll see reproducing happen. And I'm not talking biological reproducing. I'm talking about spiritual reproduction. Brothers and sisters, never forget why we are still waiting. Christ's delay is an act of his mercy toward humanity. God is not willing that any should perish, but that everyone should come to repentance. And he's given us the task of making disciples. So we need to ask ourselves the question, what am I doing to be part of the process of making disciples? Who specifically am I praying for? Who specifically am I building relationship with? Who specifically am I investing and pouring myself out into in hopes of making disciples? After all, that's what God called the church to do. He called us to make disciples. Healthy, growing, reproducing. There are three little words that have sort of become a motto around here at Prince Street Church. Words that remind us that that being a disciple of Jesus Christ is not about being religious. It's about being in a thriving relationship with Christ. 
healthy, growing, reproducing. They're words that remind us that as we eagerly anticipate the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, we're not just called to wait. We're called to wait well. 